We're continuing today the Everything is Spiritual series. We started last week, so it's going to run uh, this week and two more. And so uh, last week we talked about the topic, Am I Entertaining? And it was kind of a double entendre of sorts that um, on one hand, um, do demons, we're going to use that word quite a bit this morning, so just buckle up and um, do demons find me entertaining and, and, or do I entertain them, meaning do I show them hospitality? Um, do I do things and watch things and consume things that they like, that they find entertaining? And the Bible says that Satan is the father of lies, and when he lies, he speaks his native tongue. And I don't know if you've ever thought about it like this, but truth is actually as foreign a language as if you speak English and someone around you is speaking a language that you don't know, the Bible says that truth is like that to the devil. That when, when he speaks lies, he speaks his native language. And so he absolutely hates truth. It's, it's a language that he can't speak. You could say it this way, that he thinks truth is gross. And so the more like Jesus we become the grosser the devil thinks we are. And so the question we really answered last week is, does the devil think I'm gross or does he think I'm fun and entertaining? Do I show the enemy hospitality or does he have to leave when I walk into a room? Uh, we're going to get into the how-to of sorts in week four, so you want to come back for that, it's going to be a good time. But that was last week in a nutshell. And today, it's going to get weird. I just wanted to apologize ahead of time. It's going to be weird. I asked the Lord all week long if I could preach something else today because I didn't want to preach this today. And he said no. So if you want to get mad at somebody, you can throw rocks at the sky when you leave, I guess. Um, But today, we're going to unveil truth, and the devil and his demons absolutely hate truth. And we're going to look at what some people call ancient mythology and what they believed and see if there's actually any truth to what they believed. And I told you last week that this week we were going to talk about the origins of the entertainment industry. So we're going to talk about how entertainment was born into the world. And remember from the purpose test that we talked about a couple of weeks ago that the designer's intended purpose for something matters, right? So an umbrella was the illustration we used, that when you look at an umbrella, you know what an umbrella is designed to be used for. So I have a question for you. If you were going to buy a stocking stuffer for your child for Christmas and you had the option between buying your child a Barbie doll or a voodoo doll, which one are you buying? I know Barbie's got issues, but it's okay. <laughs> Barbie doll or a voodoo doll? Any, anybody buying the voodoo doll? Why? Because a voodoo doll has an intended purpose of witchcraft. It can also work in the reverse. If, if I was going to auction off a guitar for sale, and I took the guitar that Nathan played this morning, and I auctioned that one off, and then I went and found one of Jimi Hendrix's guitars, like the one he lit on fire, and I put those up for auction, which one's going to command more money? Anybody voting for Nathan's guitar? <laughs> But why? It's because of the history of his guitar. The history matters. The history imparts value to the thing. And so we're going to talk today about the origins of Greek and Roman theater and how Greek and Roman theater is the great, 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 a bunch of times, the grandfather of modern television, movies, gaming, sports, and literary works. And so we're going to look primarily at the 5th and 6th century Greek and Roman worship today. Um, the title of the message today is Blame It on the Roots. And yes, that's a play on a Garth Brooks song. All right. 
<laughs> let's, let's pray and we'll get into it this morning. Lord, open our eyes to see the plans and the schemes of the enemy in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. All right, we'll get right into it. Point number one, myth or legend, does it matter? Myth or legend, does it matter? So Greek and Roman theater has its origins in the seasonal festivities of a Greek god named Dionysus. Now, Dionysus was the god of wine. I mean, he's also the god of ecstasy, and his festivities um, were basically drunken adult parties. You all with me? Yeah. We got kids in the room, so I'm going to keep it as PG as I can. So drunken adult parties. You all got it? And these ancient myths, they weren't just stories, but they were actually a religion to these people. So what we call myth, they called religion. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20 and 21, the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God, and I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too, you cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Okay, that word for demons is in the Bible 63 times. It's translated demon 63 times. So there's no wiggle room on what the Bible's saying there. The Dallas Morning News put out an article in 2004, right before the Olympics in Athens. And there was, a, I'm going to read a quote from this, from this excerpt they they put out in the Dallas Morning News on August 6, 2004. It said, they said, you'll soon be hearing a lot about Apollo, Dionysus, Athena, and their friends and relations. The ancient Greek gods and goddesses will be front and center at the Olympic Games scheduled to start next week in Athens. These days, the ancient deities are the stuff of myth and legend. But three millennia back, people really believed in Zeus, Hera, and the rest of the Greek pantheon. This was religion, as unexceptional in its day as the Baptists and Methodists are today. This old-time religion had plenty in common with modern faiths and differed in some important ways. The Greeks and the Romans after them worshipped these gods for 1,500 years or more. Um, if you go to Wikipedia and you look up Dionysus, I'm just showing you this is commonly accepted academic um, information. The, in, on Wikipedia, it says that festivals of Dionysus included the performance of sacred dramas enacting his myths, the initial driving force behind the development of theater in Western culture. And so why does that matter? Because I don't know if you've noticed or not, but the rest of the world is not emulating Japanese theater. They're emulating what we put out in Hollywood. Our entertainment industry is the center of the entertainment industry for the entire world and our culture right now, and it matters the origins of that and the influence that things can have on that. So this guy Dionysus, he's the god of, of wine and ecstasy, um, but he was all actually known, if you go to his, if you look up Dionysus, look up other names of Dionysus, there's about a hundred of them. He had about a hundred names. He was known by different people groups as different names. Um, but he was often referred to as the horned god. And so if you think about like on Halloween when little kids, they dress up in little devil costumes with the horns, they're actually dressing up as Dionysus. That's where we get the image of the horned god. It comes from Dionysus. Uh, the Romans called him Bacchus. Um, when, when, when the Greek gods became Roman gods, they changed his name to Bacchus. And Bacchus was the crazy one, the mad one. We say mad, that means like he was insane. Um, he, he also has a name that is similar to Lucius. Um, that means the loosener or the liberator. Anyone, does that sound familiar? Anyone, the name Lucius? Is that ringing any bells of any, anything you might want to be aware of in the Bible? And so Dionysus was known for insanity, and, and his goal, the goal was that he would get these people so drunk that he would work them up into a frenzy so that they would do things that they normally wouldn't. And these people who would get whipped up into a frenzy, they would go absolutely and totally nuts. And so I'm going to spare details, because um, it's Sunday morning, but... Um, just know that the stuff that happened at these festivals was absolutely abhorrent, sick stuff, like dismemberment, things like that. 
absolutely disgusting. So I taught a message last summer about Peter, and, and I taught about and when Jesus says to Peter that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, um, they were actually at the temple of Pan when he said that. And so Jesus even gives credence. He's, he's acknowledging that these gods were, had influence in their culture. And so this, these Dionysian, I can't pronounce the word, Dionysian, that's the word, Dionysian, Dionysian revelries, as they were called, these adult parties that they would have where they would get really drunk and lose all their inhibitions. Um, the only people that were allowed to attend were women. There were no men allowed. And in fact, if you were a man and you showed up at a dynasty in revelry, you, would not, you wouldn't live. Like, they would kill you. And so you might ask, like, well, okay, well, how is this an adult party? Well, the only people who were allowed to attend these were women and satyrs. If you don't know what a satyr is, Pan, the Greek god Pan is a satyr. A satyr is half man, half goat. So, just bear in mind, gross, abhorrent things happening, worshiping this god Dionysus. And among all these other things, one of the things that Dionysus would ask for, people would get drunk and, and he would ask them to retell his stories, the myths that he would tell. And these stories that he would tell, um, stories and songs were usually about the downfall of a great man. And so why is that? Well, because that's what Dionysus likes. He liked to see people go crazy and he liked to see people fall and people fail. And it's actually the origin, if you look up Greek tragedy, they will point back to these Dionysian revelries as the origin of tragedy stories. And in fact, we get the word tragedy comes from two Greek words. The first one is tragos, that means goat, and oide, which means song. And so when he requested these tragedies, they were actually called a goat song. That sounds crazy and weird, right? I wonder if the Bible talks about goat worship and goat songs. You ever seen anything in the Bible about goat worship? You're about to. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 7. It says, They must no longer offy, offer, offy, offer, <laughs> Any of this, any was the next word. They must not offer any of their sacrifices to the goat idols to whom they prostitute themselves. This is to be a lasting ordinance for them in the generations that come. So when Jesus says, on this rock, I'm going to build my church, they were standing in front of the temple of Pan where goat worship was happening. Okay? All right. That's enough. That's... We're done with that. <laughs> so if you read the Bible, the stories in the Bible are of people succeeding, people healing, people being healed, people being redeemed, people being set free, the hope for humanity through the saving power of Jesus, for the salvation is a gift from God, not, but not by work so that no man can boast. It's the gift of God. Dionysus liked stories of people who killed their own families who participated in incestual activities, who went insane. Um, stories like Oedipus Rex, if you're familiar with the story of Oedipus Rex. I'm not going to talk about it this morning. Go look it up. It's pretty gross. But the story of Oedipus Rex was written in tribute to Dionysus. In fact, in the story of Oedipus Rex, they actually referenced Dionysus in the story. And so what I'm, what I'm telling you this because it matters where the origins of this stuff comes from. It it's, can be a doorway that we can open up to the enemy if we're not careful. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 22, verse 3, you are holy enthroned on the praises of Israel. That word enthroned, in some translations say that he inhabits the praises of his people. That word enthroned means he dwells in the praises of his people. So I have a question for you. If we serve a God who dwells where he is praised, where do little g gods dwell? They dwell where they're welcomed, where they're praised, where they're given the seat of honor. All 
All right, point number one. <laughs> Was myth or legend doesn't matter? I don't think it matters. Point number two, the requests of the gods. You can put that back up and... Okay, so we're done with mythology. We're going to move into history now. This is recorded history from history books. Dionysian worship started in the woods, but it eventually moved into the temples. And when it moved into the temples, it was institutionalized. And we're going to look at the Oracle of Delphi as an example of how this, how this worked. And so the Oracle of Delphi um, was, was a place of worship to the god Apollo. And Apollo, the, as the myth goes, was searching for a place where he could erect his temple. And he found this land that he wanted to build his temple on. The problem was there was this prophetic serpent named Pythos um, that inhabited this land. And so Apollo went to the land and he killed Pythos. Um, but the problem is the spirit of Pythos stayed on the land and he built his temple on top of, of this place where this prophetic snake, I don't want any snake talking and telling the future, but they set this temple up where this prophetic snake lived. And Apollo was the god of poetry. He was the god of archery. He was the god of the sun. He's the one who escorts the sun across the sky. But he's also the god of plague. <laughs> so you see, these, these little g gods, they, they, they had these, these great qualities, but they all have um, a, a, an unredeemable quality about them. And so we see Dionysus, he's the god of the good time. He's the god of wine and a party, but he's also the god of insanity. We see Apollo is the god of poetry and the god of the sun, but he's also the god of plague. If you look at someone like Zeus, Zeus was the god of the sky and the thunder through lightning bolts. He was the ruler of the gods, but he was immoral and angry and vengeful. And so what would happen is in this temple that they erected, there was an oracle and uh, there was an oracle and a priest and the oracle would go into this chamber and would inhale, there was a crack in the floor and the vapors, there's hallucinogenic vapors that came up from the floor, the crack in the floor in the oracle of Delphi is still there. You can go there today and see the crack in the floor in the chamber where the Pythia, this oracle, they called her a Pythia um, because she spoke the, she was the voice of Pythos. And so she would inhale these hallucinogenic fumes become and hallucinate, and then she would start mumbling under her breath, and then a priest would come into the room where she was hallucinating and mumbling, and she would say, like, whatever the gods had requested, and then the priest would come out of the temple and would announce to the people, this is what the gods say. Okay, y'all with me so far? And the gods would request a theatrical show, a festival, or a game. You might be thinking, like, what's wrong with a game? Nothing's wrong with a game. But there was always something twisted about what they would ask. So they would ask for a sporting event, but they would make everybody play naked. And, and over time, like, these things, like, things like that would happen. They would, they would request these things, but there was always something a little bit twisted about what they would request. And the Greeks believed that this place, Delphi, was literally the center of the earth. It was a, like the belly button of the earth, and, and that um, in, in Apollo's temple, that that's where the gods spoke to the people. And so what were these things that they requested? Well, they requested the things that they liked. And so like, it would be like going to watch the Cowboys game play, but every time they score, someone's got to get killed or something. Like, there was always something twisted about what they asked for. And why did, they, why did they require that these activities were depraved? And it's because their gods loved depravity. And so what I want you to know this morning is that the worship practices, what we call mythology, ancient Greeks and Romans called religion. They worshipped these gods the same way that we're sitting in church this morning. They had a form of worship for these gods, and they practiced that for 1,500 years. And these, these performances, the, the worship at the Oracle of Delphi, and, and these, these theatrical performances and, 
and these activities that were set to honor gods like Apollo and Dionysus and Zeus. The Olympic Games were, were formed to honor Zeus. There were actually a set of games called the Pythian Games to honor Apollo. Um, so they, they, these games were formed as a form of worship for these gods. So does that mean that sports and movies are evil? No, not necessarily. But does it mean there's a potential for the enemy to use those things to influence us or influence our culture? 100%. I was, <laughs> I was thinking about this, and I, was, I don't know, I wasn't going to include this, but it's kind of funny. So you become what you're around. And so there was a season in my life, circa 2006, that I didn't wear anything but cowboy boots and 20X jeans with a snuff ring worn in the back of them and said words like broham. <laughs> and then a few years later, I was what I like to call accidentally emo. <laughs> Cameron's laughing because he was there. So, I wanted to be rock and roll, but I was a little depressed. So it was accidentally emo is what I like to call it. But you become what you're around. So what you let influence you will change you. You will become what you're around. Dave Ramsey would say, you're the sum of your five closest friends. If you take the five closest people to you, there's a really good chance that you're the average of those five people. In temperament, in income, in position in life, all those things. You're the sum of your surroundings. So it's important. All right, point number three, the temple and the theater. Is this weird yet? No? All right, good. Sweet, y'all are as weird as I am. I love it. All right, so Rome fell in 476 AD. And we're going to look at the fall of Rome and how the enemy used entertainment to change the culture um, in Rome and ultimately caused the fall. But what we're talking about today is a book that Augustine wrote in 412 AD called The City of God. And there was an argument in Rome that Rome was falling because it had recently adopted Christianity as a national religion. So in 312 AD was the Battle of Melvian Bridge with Constantine. And, so, and Constantine had this vision that if you profess Jesus as Lord, that you know, I'll, I'll make things go well for the, the Roman Empire. And so Constantine gives his life to Jesus and then says, like, all right, now everyone's going to be Christian in Rome. That was in 312. So it's 100 years later, Constantine writes this, this book because um, people were saying that Rome is, Rome is failing because of Christianity. And what Augustine is saying is, like, no, Rome's not falling because you've been worshiping God for 100 years. Rome is falling because you've been worshiping demons for 1,500 years. So that's the premise of the city of God. And so the, I'm going to read a quote from the book that, that says, The gods themselves sternly commanded, indeed almost extorted the production of such shows, demanding that they should be consecrated in their honor. History will bear this out against anyone who would deny it. I have a question for you. Does our God extort us to do things for him? And so why would these gods, of course not, that's the answer, no, of course not, he does not. <laughs> so why would these gods request these things, shows, festivals? Because worship began in the temple, but it finished in the theater. It was a, it was a, two-part, a two-part system. The, the oracle would say, I want a show, and the implied meaning of the god saying, I want a show is, and you've got to go see it too. And so attending these plays, attending these games, attending these festivals was a form of worship. It was required from the gods. And these things were very depraved. I'm telling you, there was one point, you know the Colosseum in Rome? Yes. Yeah. There were some pretty abhorrent things that happened in the Colosseum. One time they put a boat in the Colosseum. They filled it with water. And then they filled it with people. And then they put a bunch of crocodiles in the water. And then they sank the boat. 
There was one time to light the, to light the Colosseum, they took the bodies of Christians and put them around the top, poured oil on them, and used them to light the games at night. I'm telling you, there was some pretty evil stuff that happened during these games. And so people would get whipped so much up into a frenzy that they would like chant for people to be killed. And then in the theater, these productions, you would see things like violence. They actually were the inventors of special effects. Um, the Greeks and the Romans were the first ones to invent fake blood. So when somebody died, they could like crush a ketchup packet. That was, they were the first ones to do that. They invented special effects. Um, and there would be things the gods like, depraved stuff. Go with me? Bad stuff. So, but you can't live in debauchery forever. And if, and if the enemy just like, if, every, if everything we did was just evil, like we'd be like, no, I'm not doing that. Like, no. Look what the Bible says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. And so he's not an idiot. And so the, the devil dresses it up a little bit. Remember we talked last week about how the vampire wears a tuxedo. The vampire doesn't like knock on your door and say... I want to come in and kill you and your whole family. The vampire knocks and says, hey, I don't want to be rude. You know, I'd, I'd like to be invited to come in. And he comes in where he's dressed all sharp. We talked about debonair, suave. And then we invite him in because if he can make it acceptable, if he can make it entertaining, if he can make it something about it positive and then just mix in a little bit of depravity, well, then we'll let him in. And we'll let him fill our living rooms. We'll let them fill our minds. We'll let them teach our kids. Listen, what I'm telling you today is the forefather of the entertainment industry, the forefather of everything that we do for entertainment, the loosener, the drunk, crazy, horned God, bad guy, has a doorway into your home. He's got a doorway into your pocket. Twenty five hundred years ago, they had to go to a temple and a theater and a stadium. Now the theater is in our pocket, twenty four seven. Oh, Canaan, I don't know where Canaan's at. Canaan, if you're here, huh? Oh, all right, Maddox. Then, <laughs> listen, we get to choose what we're entertained by, what we think about. I'm not saying your favorite sport is bad. I don't think. Rooting for the Cowboys is worshiping demons. That's the Eagles. <laughs> it's Mother's Day. I didn't want to pick on my favorite team to pick on today. It's because I love y'all. We'll say that for next week. <laughs> but here's an example, a test that you can do to see if you might need to examine yourself. So when the Cowboys get knocked out of the playoffs or don't make the playoffs, which were like 30 for 30, Texans aren't any better. Don't talk. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. Sean's a Texans fan, so y'all can pray for him later. Um, <laughs> that's a tough life. <laughs> but when the Cowboys get knocked out, like, yeah, of course, I'm sad. I'm mad. I'm sad. Like, I'm, like I want them to do well because I want something to happen, it doesn't. Like, of course, that's a little bit of a bummer. And Des did catch it. But I go to bed and I wake up the next day and I'm fine. I don't care. Why? Because I don't let grown men playing a child's game control my emotions. Mothers, that was a gift for you. You can use that later. I don't let grown men playing a child's game control my emotions for very long. <laughs> so I'm not saying that if you get mad at a sports game, you got a demon. I'm not saying that. 
But back then, when they went to a sporting event, they were literally worshiping demons. They were worshiping their gods. And I believe that they were real people who lived at one point. But what I am saying is that the devil uses entertainment to get access. And his ultimate plan, remember the drunken, crazy, horned god guy, Dionysus, his goal is to get people whipped up into a frenzy, acting crazy, and doing things that they otherwise wouldn't do. Does that sound like our culture? Does that sound like any, I don't care which news channel you watch, both of them. (laughs) Both of them have the goal to whip you into a frenzy and do things you wouldn't normally do. Like cut off relationships because you don't like the guy who got elected. That's dumb. It's a plan from the enemy. To use things to cause division in people. That's just for free. That's not even in my notes. (laughs) But there's something that we can do about it. The Bible says in Philippians 4.8, you know this, you've seen this on bumper stickers, refrigerator magnets, and the sort your whole life. Finally, Brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. See, sometimes when I notice that I'm not as sensitive to the Lord as I'd like to be, I have to take an inventory and see, am I filling myself with things that aren't true, noble, pure, admirable? And when I notice something change in me, I look at what's going on around me. What am I watching? What am I listening to? Who am I hanging out with? Because it's going to make, it's going to impact me. And so for me, I've told you before, I don't watch scary movies, like at all. If the intent behind a film is to create fear, I don't watch it. That's a personal thing. Because I'm sensitive to that. There's plenty of things that I'm not, that don't bother me. But anything that's designed to create fear, there's a spirit behind that. The Bible says, I haven't given you a spirit of fear, but I have given you a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Power, love, and a sound mind sounds like the Holy Spirit. The Bible contrasts the spirit of fear with the Holy Spirit. I think the spirit of the fear is the spirit of the Antichrist, personally. That's a different sermon. That's what I believe. (laughs) But like everything else, like the way we do discipleship around here, we... Ask the Lord. We, we, it's on the wall out there. Hear, believe, obey. Ask the Lord. Do what he says. Ask God, is it okay for me to, is it a good idea for me to watch this? Is it a, is it a good idea for me to park my kid in front of the TV watching this program? Ask the Lord. Don't ask me. I'm not going to tell you whether you can watch a show or not, but the Lord will. Ask him. I'm not the arbiter of your media intake. Like I'm not coming to your house and checking your DVD shelf and looking at your browser history. It matters though. So ask God and do what he says. So I want to encourage us this morning to examine what you're taking in. Examine the entertainment that you're consuming and the activities that you're participating in. Seek out and and really put it to the test. Like, does this, is this beneficial? Paul says, all things are permissible and not everything's beneficial. I can, I've got freedom. I can do whatever I want. But that also means that I can end up somewhere I don't want to be. It's like a, it's like a tree. I, I named this message, Blame It on the Roots. You see, you can't see the root system of a tree. But the root system influences the health and the growth of the entire tree. And so with our culture, where are our roots? There are roots into ancient practices specifically that influence the entertainment industry, but we have the power to not let those things influence us. We're going to talk more about that next week. We're going to look next week at how how this entertainment industry, this culture impacted Um, the ancient Romans in how that led to the fall of Rome in 476 and what the church thought about it when it happened um, at the time. And then in week four of this message, I'm going to tell you what you can do about it. 
and I think I'm going to call that one not today, Satan. We'll see. Um, but I'm going to talk about in that one um, some experiences that I've had interacting with things um, and how you can walk in the authority that God gives you to walk in. Um, but like we said last week, um, there's no fear in this topic because if you've got Jesus, you've got more authority and more power than anything that would raise itself up against him. And so when we talk about these things, they don't like being talked about. Um, they, don't, they don't like uh, seeing what they're doing and, the, and the, the plan that they're working out. That's why it doesn't get talked about. Um, but I want to encourage you this week to just pay attention to the things that you open yourself up to because it matters. And so are the things that we're watching, watching are they nurturing us with truth or misguiding us with a beautifully disguised lie? That the devil shows up, that's the, the vampire in a tuxedo. Are we entertaining the vampire in a tuxedo? Or is he not allowed in our house because we told him he has to go? I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And like we do every week, we ask the Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me through this message? I would just encourage you to ask, is there anything I'm entertaining that I shouldn't? Let me pray and uh, Pastor Dan will come close us. Lord, I thank you that that you're the God of truth, that you're the way, the truth, and the life. And Lord, that whenever we seek you, Lord, that the enemy has to flee. And so Lord, right now, Lord, Lord, I pray that you would show us, Lord, if there's any area that we've entertained something that we shouldn't, Lord, I pray that you would um, open our eyes to the root behind the things that we're entertaining Lord, I pray that you would um, give us the, the wisdom, Lord, to speak truth to lies. And Lord, I pray that you would um, protect us as we go throughout this week, Lord, and continue to reveal yourself to us and the choices that we make, Lord, so that we can become more like you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen.